Yeah, let me start my clock here. But um, uh, so first, I have to apologize. I, I actually totally created this uh, talk title as bait. And um, you know, in the process of actually writing the talk, I was like, there's actually not that much category theory in here. Not that I really understand it. And so, so, so really what this is all about is abstract algebra. Um, there, there are pieces in as, abstract algebra that I found were very useful um, when creating this talk. So just to reframe where this conversation is, that's, that's, you know, that's where I am. Uh, that's where we're at. So about me, I'm a software engineer on a data science team at a hedge fund called Co2 Management based in New York. I've been doing Scala for the last six years. Uh, I've done lots of things since, um, you know, in my career, uh, web applications, data engineering, whatever you name it. Um, so it's not like I, I've only lived in Spark. Um, you know, I've, I've seen kind of Scala from, from, the, uh, from the lens of the last six years, so I've done Play, H4S, et cetera. Uh, I'm interested in lots of things. Um, if any of these things sound cool to you, um, I'd, I'd love to, to talk. Um, someone pointed out to me the other day in my, uh, I, I have a weird interest in uh, fountain pens and that also has the uh, initials of FP, so uh, <laughs> I thought that was super, uh, super obvious, but anyways. Um, so uh, talking, about, talking about my workplace, I, 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 again, I do data engineering code too. We embrace type functional programming. Um, we, we pretty much try to stay on the cutting edge as much as possible, you know, um, with us believing that this is, gives us a competitive advantage. So our stack is Scala, Spark. Um, we, we employ everything from Cats, Shapeless, FS2, HV4S, um, you name it. There's basically no barrier for us to, to, to adoption other than our own time. Um, we have offices in New York and Menlo Park. If you're interested, um, come talk to me afterwards or hit me up on email or, or Twitter. So, um, so my talk title uh, is, is about big data, you know, where big data, FP, and, and abstract, abstract algebra meet. And, um, you know, specifically what this talk is going to be about is aggregations. Um, aggregations in the large and the small. Uh, by small, I mean something that's like single process using maybe like a standard library. Large is something like big data, you know, something maybe backed by Spark uh, data sets or RDDs. Um, and I'm just going to, you know, jump right into it uh, initially and just say this is about semi-groups and monoids. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, some of the other uh, speakers have, have mentioned this before. I think uh, Runar's talk and, and Ross's talk earlier today mentioned semi-groups and monoids. Well, I, I'm going to try and break that down a little bit um, more uh, uh, simply and, and motivate you to, um, to think about why, why this stuff matters. Um, and, and one thing that's uh, cool about them is that they, these come with laws, like an extra set of rules that, that, they, uh, that these abstractions must also adhere to. So um, let, let's, let's start with um, you know, an example in SQL. Uh, this is a super, super simple aggregation. We're just taking a column and we're summing it across the table, right? Um, let's say I want to rewrite that in terms of Scala. Um, so we have a list of of numbers, this is my x. I'm going to um, do what's called a fold operation. So if you can kind of squint a little bit, you see that uh, this, this, this fold is um, a higher order function that takes, uh, for its first um, parameter, a, a zero operation. So let's say that if that list happened to be empty, that's like the default value. And then it takes a function that combines um, your type t and t into a single value. In this case, we're just adding it up, so we're just gonna add x1 to x2, and at the end, we get the sum, which is 6. Turns out it's, it's a very similar look in Spark as well. You can, you can you know, take a data set, drop down to an RDD, and fold over it, um, given a zero value um, and, and the addition function. Um, I, I do have to say that this is a little bit different in, in Sparkland, because uh, it, it, you do get the same answer, but under the hood, this actually distributes it across your cluster. So you can imagine that if you, know, you have a lot of numbers, like millions or billions of them, and you have a large cluster, you can parallelize the work. So that, that fold uh, actually applies a function across a partition and then folds the final results, which may result in you know, network calls or shuffles um, to get you that one answer in your driver. So looking at the two examples, uh, I'm sure you can see how similar they actually are. Um, you know, let's let's think about this. Can we can we abstract this away? Can we can we pull stuff out and and um, you know put this in a place where we can reuse this? 
So um, I, I'm going to jump right into um, you know a pattern that we use in, in type functional programming called type classes. This is something that uh, you know we can use to, to to define interfaces that can be reused. So essentially, I, I, I'm going to I'm just going to you know create a trait called combinable. Uh, it's got two operations. One is a zero operation, and one is the the binary operator combine, which takes your two a's and gives you back an a. So so when I when I define this combinable, what I really mean is I can have a, an interface uh, combinable for, for a certain type A, let's say it's an int or a long. It's, it's a little bit, uh, for, for anyone who comes from like object-oriented um, um, approaches, it's, it almost feels a little bit inverted. Um, so, um, so from there we create a, an implicit um, combinable instance that uh, is taken in a, a generic fold function for lists that um, um, it, t it takes that combinable instance and uh, actually applies the zero and the, and, and the uh, binary operator in, inside its implementation. And so, um, you know, we can, we can d pull out that implementation into this type class instance. So, uh, if, now that we define this combinable, um, you know, we can, we can if, you, if you do a little bit of research, and I, I'm just gonna like kind of make a jump, this is what we call a monoid in, in abstract algebra, and this is something that, um, you know, uh, uh, functional programming lab libraries like Scala-Z or, or CATS finds. Uh, I, I just took a, a minimal um, uh, definition from, from CATS and, you know, just renaming things, this is, this is what it looks like. So, in my head, I mean, you know, people talk about, like, precision of terms and, like, monoids is what, what, it, what it actually is in, in, in literature. In my head, I, I still kind of think of it as that, you know, two things that you can combine. Um, I, I find that to be a lot friendlier to explain to people and a lot, um, a lot more understandable in my own head. So uh, I mentioned before that you know, these, some of these abstractions come with laws. Um, uh, from, and, and the reason why this, this might matter is, you know, depending on how we want to implement it, these laws tend to, tend to matter. Um, so in, in, in uh, a list fold, uh, the Scala doc actually says that this binary operator must also be associated. Um, and I'll explain what that means uh, in the next slide. And in RDD, and in an RDD fashion, um, the summary is that it also requires your function to be commutative. Um, so so um, the code that you're calling kind of has these soft requirements that aren't really captured by the type system um, up front. And so uh, when we speak of associativity, we, we mean that the, the, that binary operator um, you know, when you rearrange the parens, it still kind of means the same thing according to the order of operations. So uh, the, the, the kind of a, a summary here is that if you combine x and y and then combine that result with, with z, it's the same thing as combining x with the, the combination of y and z. And then commutativity is uh, if you rearrange the order of your operations, that doesn't change the, uh, the result. Um, and the reason why that, that would even matter in a distributed fashion, in a distributed context is because you know, you, you don't have control over um, over the order of and the associativity of, of your of the application of that operator. You kind of just um, you, you you give it to uh, the runtime and it kind of just does its thing. So um, because of that, we can we can actually you know add this extra property to our monoid. We can call this instead of commutative monoid. Um, and something that that's really cool about the Cats project is it it also publishes. Um, these laws and a toolkit for you to actually test them. So t this check all function is actually something that comes from the uh, the cat's laws uh, sub project, and um, you know I can I can actually pass in my own implementation here, and it will check it against um, against these uh, associativity community uh, commutativity laws, and I think there's a bunch of other ones, but these these are the ones we care about right now. Um, so you can kind of see the, the the results of this is like I, I promise you this is passing. The syntax highlighting didn't do all that well. Um, but I can write my own instances and I can check it against laws, which is pretty cool. So, um, so now, now we can go, go back and modify our, our, our fold function over, the, over a data set and actually require that it needs a commutative monoid. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're doing this so that um, when, when users try to pass in their own mo uh, monoids, we're enforcing that this, this both needs to be commutative and uh, and associative, and as, as I mentioned before, you know, at this point, this is like the the 
you know, we're, we're, we're passing the runtime, so we just like, we have to trust the process that, that'll, that'll do what it needs to do. Um, so I, 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 you know, constructed this, this example, a very simple example of, of summing up numbers, right? But real life code tends to be more complicated. Um, if you want to do anything useful, you have like domain types or, you know, row types that, that really model your problem. So um, what happens if we introduce uh, uh, like a, a tuple my type? Um, this is something that you know is specific to my uh, to my business logic, um, and I'm going to naively try to just write a semi group for this, right? I, I'm not going to really think about it as that that hard. Um, and, and a semi group uh, that we're introducing here is is like a monoid, but it doesn't have the zero op, uh, the zero operator, the empty. Um, so I'm just going to like. Try and smash it together and see what happens. Well, and then and then you know I, I know that my name field is is kind of like a key. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to pick one and just hope it compiles, right? I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Unfortunately, like because because we're just picking a side, it it doesn't commute anymore. You know, when you flip around the x and y, uh, you, you're not getting the equivalent values that that you're supposed to. Um, this is it's not a community semi group. So I, I mentioned before that, you know, well, let's say that we wanted to combine these my types, right? And we know that name is a key. Um, what if we just group by the key and then summed up the values or combine the values? Um, how I'd write that in SQL is, you know, I group by my name uh, and then I'd sum or combine sum the X and Y. This would work in SQL pretty simply, but I want to bring this into Scala. So what, what this starts to take the shape of is more about like a monoid of lists of my types. Uh, I take a, you know, a collection of my types on two sides. I, um, I group by my name or my, my specific field. And then you know, I won't go into the specifics of the implementation, but um, I delegate to uh, semi-group instances for uh, int and, and option of long to combine those values. And then I get my, my type. Um, in the in the when you're in the reduced context there, since you know kind of it's, it's specific to the implementation, but you know that those reduces are already um, grouped by a key. So uh, it, I'll, it's a little bit hand wavy. I'm just just going to say that picking a side, uh, uh, picking a name here, uh, works because you've already grouped. And you can do the same thing with um, uh, in, in Spark, writing a monoid of data set of my type. You're doing you're, you're grouping by key and you're reducing the groups and um, you know you, you'll you'll get something back that is a, the correct answer. Um, but so there, there's a caveat, right? Like if if I'm going to have a bunch of these domain types for 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 business logic that I care about, um, I have to provide concrete instances for every single one of these types and every single collection that I might care about. Um, that I mean, that sounds, it, it could work. It sounds like a lot of work um, and you know, a lot of typing. Um, is there a way for us to abstract away some of these things, um, some of this logic? Um, I think if, you know, if we're starting to explore what type classes are and, and, and abstractions for aggregations, why can't we abstract away this? Um, and the hint is, well, let, let, let's see if there's a type class approach to this. So let's, let's, you know, let, let's think about, let's try and pull out a pattern here where we're, maybe there's a, a type class we can define that takes our type T and splits it to a key and value. And then, you know, we, we also pr have to provide a, a way to get back to, to our T because ultimately we still care about what that T was. Um, uh, ignore the serializable thing. It's a more of a Spark implementation detail that kind of bleeds everywhere. Um, um, so, so we're 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 taking that key and we're splitting it to values. Um, what that could look like is, you know, uh, it's a little mechanical, but I'm defining a separate class or case class for for the, strictly the values of my type, um, and then I define functions that uh, uh, take that T and split it into a KV tuple. So, uh, because of that, now I can write a community semigroup strictly on just the values. Now I have a concrete type that I can say, I, I want a semigroup that combines these values, and I'm just going to delegate to whatever Cat says. I don't have this problem of uh, defining a semigroup for a type where 
you know, it's no longer commuting. Um, and now let's let's try the, the, the full approach for a list, right? Let, we're going to take a, um, it, the, and I'm not sure if you're, you know, not everyone's familiar with the syntax, but there's actually two different implicits here. One is the commutative semigroup is a context bound that's defined on, on um, your value V, which is usually something of values, um, and then a, an implicit parameter K, KV, um, which is a, a, a key value type class, um, which wraps over those functions from going to and for, from the KV pair. Um, and, and, my, and now my, my, imp, my implementation from before, if you, if you recall, which was very specific to my type, is, is now written against a generic T and um, the, the instance for, for T for, for splitting in the KV pairs. Is it, are things looking a bit clear? I, I hope I'm not losing anyone here. Please raise your hand if, if, if I am. Um, and then this, the Spark implementation, I, I like had to wrestle with this one for a while. If um, I, I mentioned in brief, in brief before, but you know some of the implementation details about Spark kind of bleed everywhere, and so um, you know you, you kind of have to provide encoders for for your T's, your K's, your V's, um, and then do some hackery to to, to get around. Um, you know, what happens when you want to serialize uh, generic types. Um, but take my word for it, this, this, this works at runtime. Um, so, so what do we just do? Uh, stepping back, we, 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 we pulled out community semigroups for, for your type Vs. We provide reusable combines for list Ts and data set Ts. Um, we have one implementation, it's still, you know, Per, per collection because of the um, uh, slight, it's very hard to abstract over data sets um, in a way that, that is amenable to um, type functional programming. But you know, we tried and we, we, we got pretty far with it. Um, this is pretty cool. Like we, we, we now have a way to um, combine two different data sets based off of a, a, a key value um, definition. So I, I will say, like you know, hacking this stuff together, there are some caveats. Um, the, the the new monoids that we just defined um, are, are a little bit finicky when it comes to actually passing those of those laws that I mentioned before about you know commutativity and and associativity. But um, I, I, in my repo, I, I do a little bit of a exploration with that, and you know, if you define uh, um, equality to be about actually what what the elements in in it, um, then it kind of works. You just need to squint a little bit. Um, and but but I will say that uh, even if even if your instances aren't always um, completely lawful, um, you know, in real so for for me in real world code, um, even unlawful instances can be useful. It's definitely way better than having to hand roll everything um, uh, yourself. Uh, it's not necessarily an endorsement of, of you know, sometimes um, you know, uh, unprincipled programming is good, but when you have to get things done, sometimes you have to. Um, and my implementations here are, are, it's not necessarily super performant. Um, I'm sure there are better ways to do these, uh, these, these um, aggregations. Um, there, there would be, you know, definitely future work to, to see if, is there anything uh, different we can do. Um, it's definitely true that you know in 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 Spark, if you start to um, stack all these query, essentially what 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 Spark does is um, when you're doing any of these FP operations, it's actually building a query plan under the hood, and it passes it to your cluster in order to execute. So you have to kind of be careful if you're going to start chaining these things together. The the query planner may not be sophisticated enough to um, combine all these things intelligently. Um, you could end up with logical plans that are much, much larger than, than what you asked for. Um, and, and a colleague of mine actually pointed out that a lot of this stuff that I'm doing with, in terms of type class derivations and, and you know, rolling out um, um, these abstractions, it's a possibility that Shapeless can do a lot of this stuff um, for you. Um, I didn't have time to actually explore that, but you know, that's, that's, this is an idea. Like, we, 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 took a, um, we took specific instances, we pulled out abstractions from it, we um, look at these abstractions. Maybe there's even more abstractions we can go on top of that. Like this is kind of how 
we as Scala developers think is like, are th let, let's let's try to keep pulling out abstractions until you know the turtles go really all the way down. Um, and and you know I, I only illustrated wh what these instances could look like for for you know lists or any sort of collections um, and Spark, but in theory you could. And, and part of the practice of this, and the reason why this is cool, is you could you know, port these uh, implementations to other frameworks like Flink, or Do, Beam, whatever. And in fact, that's exactly kind of what happened if you, uh, if you look at the Algebra project. Um, they define these interfaces called aggregators, right? And these aggregators, uh, I, I won't actually go into it or, or, or um, define what they look like, but um, these are semi-groups and monoids applied in production and at scale, and it's the application of um, these aggregations on, on Hadoop and on um, and Spotify. Shio is a is a wrapper over um, Apache Beam, but s people out there have done this, and and you know they're they're making it work because um, you know th there's a there's a, a value to type functional programming in in big data, and that's in how we define what t uh, what data types look like and how we how we um, operate over those. Um, so the code for this talk is uh, sitting on GitHub, and the slides are also already hosted. Um, so this is actually a self-referential link. Um, if uh, you have any other questions, please um, feel feel free to, you know, come and bother me. Um, I'm sure there are also holes in, in some of the logic that I uh, that I laid out. But I think um, the way I, I, I justify this um, to myself, and my team, is that these abstractions have existed for a long, long time, and I think they're. Um, they're very useful and very practical to use, and it's just something that um, you can deploy tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that's that's all I have. So I think I'm actually under time, but that might actually work because uh, we're running a little bit late. But it, are there any questions? Yes. Because the data is unordered, or why is? Ah, so I, I, so the question was, does it have to be commutative because the data is unordered? Um, uh, and uh, I guess I didn't cover that specifically. The data itself, depending on how it might sit on disk, it, it might be unordered. That's that's kind of a uh, something that you as a data engineer have very little control over in um, in a distributed context. And so. Um, not only is it the, the order of the data may not be um, guaranteed on you know, where it sits in the, in the cluster, but also the order of evaluation might not be guaranteed. It just, you, you pass in that, um, that, that reduce, or that, that folding function that, that um, from your T, T and T to T, um, passing that to, to your uh, you know, MapReduce cluster or your Spark cluster or whatever, um, it just tells you that it's going to, to apply that across the partition, and then once you get an answer for each partition, then it applies it to uh, across the cluster. So there's there's the reason why you'd use commutative, uh, a commutative monoid is because um, order is not guaranteed for your data or your evaluation, if that makes sense. Yes? So, so the question is, what happens if you have unlawful monoids, uh, let's say, in production, right? Um, the, so the law checking itself is actually some, a, a construct at test time. Um, so you can certainly write unlawful instances and ones that you know, will compile. You can definitely deploy with it. Um, the whole idea is that law checking helps you know, add an, an extra set of rules where uh, you can kind of be extra sure that, that it's, it's adhering to the interface as you expect. Um, but as I mentioned before, there, there are um, projects where you, know, you have unlawful instances, like the whole Alley Cats project within Cats is full of you know, either instances that have no laws or, or is slightly less savory in terms of its um, law checking, but they can still be useful. So the, 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 the roundabout answer is sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's not. Um, the, the, the reason why some of my instances are kind of unlawful is the order that the answers come back in is not necessarily the same as what you put in, but the elements, like the, the uh, uh, if, if you were to order them and, and just compare the elements themselves, 
it, it, it actually checks out. Uh, yes, question. Do you know if there's any like uh, immediate performance limitation <coughs> because of a lot of this stuff or it was negligible in your runtime of like smart jobs? So I, I think the question was, um, did I notice any performance improvements or regressions? Regressions. Um, well, I, I, I don't think I did a lot of performance tuning. Uh, I would say that if, if you were to, um, you know, kind of hand roll each one of these implementations and do a lot of like per performance tuning, you'd probably get it a lot faster. Um, but because I, I, the whole idea with this is that the code reuse is, worth, is worthwhile when compared to, um, you know, having to maintain n number of implementations. Um, it, I mean, honestly, just looking at the SQL, it's probably a lot more performant uh, if you were to, to just rely on that. Um, you can rely on, especially if it comes to like Spark SQL and, and Catalyst, it's a very, it's a pretty sophisticated compiler and optimizer. Um, you can rely on that more if you, if you need very, very specific um, performance profiles. And this is generally true about, um, you know, practical functional programming on the JVM with Scala is, uh, as I, I forget who mentioned it before, but you know, Sometimes you can notice at the very core and very performant, uh, performance sensitive applications, you see like a bunch of while loops, a bunch of local mutability, a bunch of like, you know, very imperative code, but that's kind of like the requirements, right? Is if you need performance and, you know, you'll go and rewrite it by hand. Yes, question. Uh, so this is that you mentioned that the uh, Spark query planner might not be sophisticated enough to take advantage of the constraints that you've built in. Um, if you were to, <coughs> want to use this pattern in production and do more performance tuning, is that the kind of thing that you could teach the query writer about? Um, I, I think in theory, yes, actually. Um, so, uh, let's see my screen back up here, but, um, so uh, if you look at the implementation of combine here, this is all, um, this is all data set or, or RDD related code. Um, these are higher level operations on, um, on what's essentially manipulating a, a query plan, uh, which is what, what uh, in Spark it's called Catalyst. It's like an AST for, for um, data manipulation on, on, a, on a cluster. Um, I, I'm, I'm not an expert at all at, at Catalyst, but I, I, I could think in theory that if you want to rewrite this in terms of Catalyst and do some really dirty stuff in order to get it to optimize really well, I, I want to say that it should be possible. Any last questions? All right then, well thanks for having me.